Welcome back to the channel. My name is Lisa Elvin Stoltari, and I am a genealogist and a passionate traveler. Over the last year or so, I've been focusing on Les Filles du Roi, the King's Daughters, and I just started this new series, Les Filles Mergui, uh, back in January. So we're on episode 14, so we're just really just getting started. There are about 260 of these ladies who came before. Uh, they really were at the very beginning of Quebec. So in many ways, they set the stage, so to speak. Um, but before we begin uh, our study of this lady that we're going to be looking at, let me show you ways that you can support the channel. The first three keep you in the know. Subscribe, like, and notify. The next couple of ones, uh, we have Patreon, we have Etsy, and we have Coffee. These are all links that I provide. A new one is called Thanks, Super Thanks, which is right on the YouTube channel, and you can just click on it and donate uh, in support of the channel. All of this helps fund the research and the time that I do um, to do all of these presentations. So I appreciate any and all people who have supported me thus far. It's amazing to me um, every time I turn and there's someone else who has supported me. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for all of you who um, are there in the trenches with me. So let's get started and find out more about La Fille Marie that we're gonna be looking at today. So Les Filles Marie were obviously ones who came between 1634 and 1662. These were not ladies, uh, as opposed to Les Filles Marie and Les Filles du Roi, who were, it was a program, it was an absolutely system, if you will. Les Filles Marie were just kind of a, a collection of ladies who came to uh, New France, uh, usually on uh, the invitation of a church or um, some a traveler or they came individually they didn't come as groups as they feel at Fiji Hua came so they're very unique in that sense and very kind of headstrong and and I find all their stories really amazing in terms of um, them taking a chance on this new life so let's get to know our Fia Mergui uh, for this episode. I do want to point out Peter J. Gagne's book, Les Fia Mergui, is probably the most, uh, it, it is the guide post for um, a study of these ladies. So if you can get your hands on Les Fia Mergui uh, by Peter J. Gagne, please do so. Episode 14 is Catherine she is a viewer request. I do not have her in my file, so let's get to know Catherine a little bit better. So Catherine was uh, born in 1640 in the town of La Rochelle in France. Her parents were Jean Foresti and Julienne Coiffé. Now let's talk a little bit about La Rochelle. It was founded during the 10th century and became an important harbor in the 12th. Until the 15th century, La Rochelle was to be the largest French harbor in the Atlantic coast, dealing mainly in wine, salt, and cheese, which you know, all French people love, and I do too. The name was first recorded in 961 as Rupella, which meant Little Rock, and La Rochelle actually has one of the richest histories of all the towns of France. From its beginnings as an area where the Knights of Templar had their strongest base, and it is also where Eleanor married Henry Plantagen in 1152, who became King of England as Henry II in 1154, thus putting La Rochelle under Plantagenet or British or English rule uh, until Henry uh, Louis VIII captured it in the 1224 siege of La Rochelle. And during the Plantagenet control of the city in 1185, Henry II had the Vauclair Castle built, remains of which are still visible in the Place de Verdun, absolutely on my top 10 list of places to go in Europe. From 1568, La Rochelle became a center for the Huguenots. And so that is one of the reasons why we see so many times La Rochelle come back and back and back because they were obviously, you know, escaping to the New World, whether they were coming to New France or, as it turns out, New York, for example, was settled by Huguenots. Um, if any of you know about New Rochelle, that's what it's called. That's where it started from. And so you have these traces of these people escaping either the fact that they were Huguenots or the fact that they didn't want to be part of that. You know, it was just a very, very challenging place to be from. You can see on the map um, that Nouvelle-Aquitaine is the region where um, it is 
based La Rochelle, and then the department, département, which means county, really is um, Charente Maritime, and La Rochelle is part of that. So, and then we have the church that um, Catherine would have been uh, baptized in, which is Saint Marguerite, which at one time was actually, um, if I understand correctly, both Catholic and Protestants were baptized here. It ultimately became um, a Catholic, uh, it reverted to a Catholic rule. But, um, and uh, we also have a lovely picture of the port of La Rochelle here as well on the upper uh, left. So let's have a look at when Catherine came to New France. So Catherine came to New France around 1657, we're fairly certain of this. Remember the ships could only come in the fall, summer or spring. So you, you kind of have to figure out like they must have come at, at some point, probably from May until um, October, let's say. Um, it, would, it would be difficult and challenging to tra travel uh, in any other period of time. So your ancestor normally would have come during that period. Now, so she can't come to New France. Who does she pick as her, as her groom? So the groom that she selects, his name is Jacques Médard de La Fontaine, and he was born in 1632 in a commune. Remember, commune means township, a small village, Mervin in France. His parents were Jacques Médard and Anne Savenel. And he is from the region of Pays de, de la Loire. Um, and his département, his county, is Vendée. So it kind of gives you an idea of whereabouts um, he is from uh, and located. And if you wanted to visit, this is, you know, an area for you. Um, as of 2019, there were about a thousand people living in this village. And the oldest mention of this village is part of the Chateau de Mervin, which dates back to the first quarter of the 11th century. Two um, charters dated 1018 and 1022 um, are both donations to the Abbey of Mazarin, uh, mention the presence of a castle in Mervin. Um, and so it kind of confirms the fact that it was, um, it was there at that time. Um, the Chateau, this is the picture I've shown you, the Chateau de la Citadière is, was destroyed during the Wars of Religion from the 17th century, but it's the current residence dates from the 17th century and, and basically was rebuilt from before. Um, and so it was destroyed during the War of Religion in 16, 1588. Um, and so it was rebuilt and rebuilt and rebuilt. It is private property, but it can't, um, but it, it remains open to weddings or seminars and that sort of thing. Um, and then we have the, uh, the church of, um, of Mervin. And so again, these date back to the 11th and 12th centuries. It appears that Jacques uh, was in Quebec or New France from 1642 as an engagé, as a 10-year-old engagé, possibly coming with someone else. We do not know, but he, there is a contract uh, record of it um, in uh, in La Rochelle, and the first mention of him in the colonies was in 1657 as a godfather uh, to uh, a baby born at that time, um, and so he was making his way in Three Rivers. This was his, um, you know, his place. Remember, 1642, Montreal wasn't even, you know, a potential at that time. Really, had just, you know. I think had just established itself. And so 1642, Three Rivers was the up and coming place that was being uh, really worked on. And that is where Jacques and Catherine were married on November 19th, 1657. In my research, I was able to find um, in the collection, uh, the bank, um, and I have provided the um, the link for you to have a look at, the, at this amazing book. But this is a picture of a a more historical part of the church where they were married, Immaculate Conception, um, and what it looked like prior to it being a cathedral. So if you want to have a look at that, I provided the link as well. So Jacques and Catherine would make their home in Trois-Rivières. Uh, give you a little bit of a brief history of Trois-Rivières. It was only the second settlement of New France. 
It was named Trovivia because the St. Maurice River has three channels that form at the mouth of the St. Lawrence River. You can see the picture on the bottom to your right, um, how it, it is laid out. Trois-Rivières is French for three rivers. It was known as three rivers for a long time in North America, but as the French regained control of their province, the French version overtook the three rivers name. When I was growing up, because I came from an English and French family, my father would call it always three rivers. It was just known that way. And eventually over time, we have reverted back to the Trois-Rivières. And Trois-Rivières has a very strategic location on the St. Lawrence River, and it helped the new nation to grow and prosper. It also proved to be an important battle in the American Revolution, the Battle of Three Rivers. Then it was called that. Some of you who have ancestors in this area at that time might be surprised at who would qualify for admission to the daughters of, or sons of the American Revolution. So we look at the map, we see that it really is between Quebec City and Montreal. This is an older part of Trois-Rivières that exists today. We have the 1666 census where we begin to see the, um, you know, they've been married now approximately nine years. What's interesting here is that they have a domestic um, and they also have a serrure domestic. That would be like a, um, like a, a welder, like somebody that is actually, um, serrure is somebody who makes keys and metal. I'd have to research it, but um, just interesting that these people are living with them uh, and enlisted with them. And it could be that, for example, the fellow named Etienne Langlois, he was probably, he, maybe he was a boarder, I don't know. Obviously, the domestic of Simon, that is a domestic, so he was actually hired by Jacques and indicates um, a little bit of their success in terms of being able to afford such a luxury. 1667 census, we have Jacques and Catherine, and then we have Marie, Jean-Baptiste, Louis, Maurice, Jean-Baptiste, again, uh, Simon Calou, Calou. Um, and um, he's the domestic, he's 20 years old, um, and they have two beasts, which means um, cows, uh, and then we have Quatre Arpents Valais, which is about one or two acres of land. So it's kind of interesting that he doesn't have a huge property, but he has somebody who is assisting him. So just a, a really curious, more research for that for sure. So eventually they would um, move to Boucherville and help found that. So they were among the early pioneers of Boucherville. And it was founded originally as a, par a parish in 1667 by Pierre Boucher, for whom the city was later named. Pierre Boucher came from Normandy and would eventually become uh, governor of Trois-Rivières. And having lived in Quebec City in Trois-Rivières, he eventually made his home uh, in Boucherville. The first Catholic church of the village was built in 1670, and this church was replaced in 1712, and then ultimately replaced by, in 1801, um, by the current saint Famille church. Several families who were in Boucherville in the 18th century left to found the communities of saint julie and saint Bruno. So these are important things to know if how your family, you know, created uh, opportunity and kept on moving. You can see Boucherville on the map. Uh, you can see it's on the other side of, um, of the river and it's up a little bit north of uh, Longueuil. I would pass it um, all the time uh, when I was uh, going home to Drummondville. So it, you know, you, you meander along there as well. So um, I would pass the sign. And um, you have a picture of Pierre Boucher there, the statue of Pierre Boucher. It's not, act, that statue is in Quebec City. This is a picture of the saint Famille Church uh, along the uh, river uh, of, um, of St. Laurent, the St. Laurent River, and of course the church. The 1681 census tells us a little bit, Jacques Ménard de La Fontaine was a charron, which means a wheelwright. So this is how he was making a lot of money. Catherine Forestier, enfin, is Jean Louis. Maurice, Jean, Marguerite, Jeanne, Anne, Catherine, Thérèse, and Jacques. They were busy. They had two guns, five goats, and seven arpamala, which is about five acres of land. On to have 13 children. Marguerite, their firstborn, would actually pass away before the 1666 census. 
Marie would eventually marry Jacques Bourdon and have 14 children, 11 of whom made it to adulthood. Jean Baptiste would marry Marie Louise Etienne and have six children, all of whom made it. Louis married Marianne Fivrier and had nine children, all of whom made it. Marie's Anne's mother, Marie Martin, was a fille du roi, who we have not yet done, but we will be eventually, so look out for that. Maurice married Madeleine Cook. At, she was, um, they had nine children, six of whom uh, made it to adulthood. Madeleine's mother was a native Canadian from the Algonquin tribe. So if that is your lineage, you have confirmed native, um, native DNA. Jean married Elisabeth Vaniquette and had six children, all of whom made it before his own early death at 36. Elizabeth's mother was Renée Lopé, who we profiled as a fille mariée in episode six. Marguerite married François Lanteau and had two children, both of whom made it. She then married Pierre Quedieu and had one child who made it before her early death at 31. Jeanne Françoise married Étienne Demers and had five children all of whom made it. She then remarried Jean-Baptiste Lachaise and had two more children who both made it. Anne married François, François Brunet and had six children, all of whom made it. Françoise, François's mother was a fille du roi, Françoise Moisin, who we profiled in episode 137. Catherine married Jacques Larivière and had nine children, all of whom made it. Marie Madeleine died in infancy. Thérèse married Jean-Baptiste Daigneau and had seven children, three of whom made it. She then married Jean Desnoyers and had eight children, four of whom made it to adulthood. Now, as for Jacques, I'm assuming he, mar he died young, but I have no further information. So if anyone has any information about Jacques, please let me know in the comments below. So Catherine would pass away at the very young age, even then, of 54. She and Jacques would have been married 37 years. Jacques would outlive her by 13 years, dying at a remarkable age himself of 75. Catherine and Jacques would produce an amazing, amazing 447 descendants by 1729. So just an amazing um, legacy that they have left us. So here are some of the resources I use to produce uh, this, these videos. Um, we have the Quebec Genealogical E-Society. We have Genealogie de Québec, d'Amérique Française. Uh, we have the American Canadian Genealogical Society, which is a very good uh, place to, to kind of dig around. The American French Genealogical Society, really good. Um, and also Quebec family history, often forgotten about. Uh, the Canadian Heritage Society of Michigan has one of the best resources. Uh, they, they have a lot of really interesting webinars. I would encourage you, if you have ancestry that goes through Michigan, certainly um, it cannot be beat. And then a new one that I have just found that I really love, and I just, I feel the love in that particular um, website. The French Canadian genealogist, love what she's doing. Genealogie Quebec, of course, is my go-to for any and all information. Um, and uh, that's kind of, I mean, there are other sources I use, but certainly those are the ones that I keep coming back to. And with that, we end episode 14 of Catherine Forestier. You know, I was really surprised that I couldn't find the Femi Menard Association. So if any of you know, um, I, I Googled it and Googled it and tried to find it and was unable. And I just find that really remarkable because uh, Menal is a family name that I grew up with. So definitely would, um, uh, you know, would love to hear if I missed that one um, so we can promote it. So uh, with that being said, we're going to we're going to thank Catherine for her contribution, for coming across, for helping to grow Trois-Rivières and ultimately Boucherville for being a pioneer there. She did not live a long, long life, but she gave us so many descendants. So for that, we are grateful for her coming to these shores, for doing what she needed to do and for racing us with her life. So we thank her for contribution and we bless her memory. Until I see you on episode number 15, au revoir.